Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is my wonderful period one AP biology class. Say hi. Hi. All right. How, po how populations evolve, and we have already watched this video, and I would recommend you, um, that you use it as a review, The Five Fingers of Evolution. You can just Google that on YouTube. And we started talking about um, this bacterium um, that became resistant to antibiotics. How would it go about doing that? Is it like some conscious decision it made? It'd say, I want to be resistant. Yes? There could be a mutation in one of them, and then the one that would survive would have reproduce more, and then that make more bacteria that way. Yes. What is that an example of? Reproduction. Oh, artificial selection. Well, yes. Did you hear this? Artificial selection. And I agree. Why? Is this an example of? Yeah, it was man-made, right? Because as we apply antibiotics, we are creating a selectional pressure for that type of bacteria who's resistant to those antibiotics to live, right? So it is a natural selection, but more specifically artificial because man imposed it. So we're starting to talk about um, population genetics. And the idea I want you to, I kind of want to implant in your head already, okay? is that when we talked about alleles, like when we looked at a tall pea plant, what, were the pos what was the possible genotype of a tall pea plant? Genotype. Big T, big T, big T, big T or big T, little T. Because tall was dominant over short. So how many different alleles were there for height? Two. What were the two alleles? <clears throat> big T and little T. Are you all right with that? Okay, so those were your two possible alleles. And if we looked at a population where most of the pea plants were short, if most of the pea plants were short, which allele frequency do you think was more common? Big T or little t? Little t, because most of them are showing up what? Short. So the little t allele frequency would probably be a smaller number, and the big t allele number would be a larger number. Do you agree with that? If over time that they were competing with one another and with other plants for sunlight, so the ones that were surviving were the ones that were taller, who could get most exposure to light, what do you think would happen to the frequency of the big T allele? It would increase. My friends, this is evolution in a nutshell. If the allele frequencies change, then evolution has occurred. If allele frequencies change, evolution has occurred. That is, in essence, what this chapter is about. And then looking at what types of things would maintain allele frequency and hence freeze it, and what types of things would contribute to changing the allele frequency. That's this whole chapter. So let's look at a population of these. Uh, what are these? Boars. Wild boars. They're very scary, and they could kill you. <laughs> All right. So when you look at a population, we're not just looking at one individual boar's allele, alleles. We're looking at the entire population. And the reason for this is when evolution occurs, it's not one individual who evolves. It's the whole what? Population. population. So we're going to look at all of the alleles. So um, when you have changes within a population, if just, a, you know, within that population, if that population changes a little bit, but it's not a new species. This is referred to as microevolution. So here is a yellow-bellied, three-toed skink, and he is carrying embryos inside. Okay, so not laying eggs. Now, why might this happen? Well, here, let me give you some details. Okay, scientists have recently caught microevolution in live action as they observed Australian lizards make an evolutionary leap from laying eggs to giving birth. Individuals of the same species of lizard living in higher, colder regions have begun to gestate and give birth while the rest of their species in lower, warmer regions continue to lay eggs. Why do you think that is? They survive better in the what? Colder temperatures. Now, as long as these new live birth skinks will mate with the other egg-laying skinks, then you're still the same species. But if they start to only hook up with other live birth 
uh, skinks and only breed with each other, then they would have formed a new species and that would no longer be microevolution, that would be what? Macroevolution. Macro okay, Goldie, put it in your own words, go. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that was, I did a flashback. I used to have gold and brown chairs before I had slate and blue. So blue, put it in your own words, go. <laughs> Microevolution is any changes you see, but you're still the same species. Like more, um, so let me do it out loud. Okay. So microevolution, you're still the same species. As long as some of them are still mating, you know, regularly with those that lay eggs, it's still the same species interbreeding together. But if you become reproductively isolated within only other live birth ones, then that would be macroevolution, an example of that. So on your notes, um, on the introduction, number one, a temporary change, seasonal, or changes during an individual's lifetime is not evolution. It must be what? Heritable. What does that mean to be heritable? In your DNA. In your DNA. Slate, could you please tell them 2A? So to be evolution, it has to be the whole population, not an individual, right? Okay, so specifically, a, uh, the change in allele frequencies in a population over, over time. The change in allele frequencies in a population over time. So types of evolution, microevolution is within a population, within a population, and macroevolution is large scale forming new species. Large scale forming new species. If my phone dings or rings, it's because I left it on to see if I can get feedback on a Chrome card. Okay, just so you know. All right. Um, na, 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 na. Now, let's look at, go back to our um, wild boars. Okay? Now, when we're looking at this boar population, we have what's referred to as the gene pool. Okay? And those are, remember, each we're diploid organisms, right? So we have two copies for every trait. So it would be as if they take those two copies and throw it in the gene pool. And now let's go in there and count up how many big bees do we have and how many little bees do we have in this gene pool. So let's count how many boars are represented right here. Seven. Seven boars. So if we have seven boars and they each have two copies, how many total copies of alleles do we have? Fourteen. Now, talk with your bio buddy. How many big B alleles do you have and how many little B alleles do you have? Count each one. Don't count here, count on the individual board. Go ahead. Two, okay, so I'll help you count. Let's count the big Bs first. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven. Are you all right with that? Okay. So big B allele frequency equals seven out of how many total did we have? Fourteen. That is equal to what? 0.5. Now, there's only two alleles here. So without counting, I think we would be able to deduce what the allele frequency is of the little. What is it? Wow, that was incredible. Wow. Okay, so I would say little b is also 0.5. Feel free to verify, okay? <laughs> Feel free to verify. So the big b allele is 0.5 and the little b allele is 0.5. Any questions on that? Now, I'm gonna teach you something. In, we have looked at several different traits. We've looked at b's and t's and r's, right? All different kinds of letters. 
when you're talking about population genetics, they don't want to say big B, little b. They establish the dominant trait, which I'm assuming is a capital letter here. The dominant trait is equal to the letter P, and the recessive trait is equal to the letter Q. 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 Would you agree that P plus Q equals 1? Yes. Yeah. So peel, P, peel, I was combining it. P is the dominant allele frequency, and in this case, it is 0.5, and the recessive allele frequency is 0.5, which equals a total of 1, or 100%. 100%. We're, well, that's easy, right? Now, when you do a Punnett square, now, now when you do a Punnett square, it's not individuals that you're doing. Make sure your eyes are up here so I know you get, get this, okay? It's not just individuals breeding because evolution occurs amongst the whole what? Population. Population. So now when we do a Punnett square, we're going to have to do it for the whole group. And just like we put the alleles, like you could put big B, little b crossed with big B, little b, right? Just like we did before. We now put the allele frequency for each one of those. So the big B allele frequency is what? 0.5, and this one is 0.5. Do you, oh, do you agree with that? And this one is 0.5, and this one is 0.5. Now another way I could do this, instead of putting big B and little b, is I could put what? P and Q, and P and Q. This is a Punnett square, get this in your head, this is a Punnett square for the entire population. I'm not mating this individual with that individual. I'm saying if we interbreed freely, what are the expected outcomes? How many do we think will be big B, big B? How many do we think will be big B, little B? How many will be little B, little B? So if we did that, what is 0.5 times 0.5? 0.25. 0.25. Okay, and that would be big B, big B, right? Do you agree? Yes. What would be another way to write that? P squared. Ah, 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 ah. Are you doing this? <laughs> where is where is PQ, by the way? Electron transport chain? Yeah. Photosystem two. Yeah. All right. I don't remember that. Okay, now. You guys, bring your brain back to me. Bring your brain back to me. Now, I would expect 25% of the population to be homozygous dominant if that's the allele frequency. If my ingredients are 0.5 and 0.5, if these are the ingredients I'm working with in my gene pool, and I am cooking this up from my gene pool, I would expect with those ingredients of having this much big B and this much little b, I would expect and predict 25% of this boar population to be homozygous dominant. That's what I am predicting. Does it mean that's what it is? No, that's just what I'm predicting. Now in this case, we actually looked at every single boar to see what they were, right? We looked at that. So, um, but this, I could also use it to predict. So over here, 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 again is what? 0 0.25, and this would be big B, little b, yes? Another way to write that is what? PQ. PQ. All right, here, again, 0.25, what would be a way to write this again? PQ. Over here, this would be what? 0.25, and this would be like little b, little b, what would be another way to write it? Q squared. I don't know what I'm writing there, but yes, I agree, Q squared. Now, we can now write another equation, okay? What are our three phenotypes that we have? We have big B, big B, we have big B, little b, and we have what? Little b, little b. These are our three, so they have to equal 100%, right? Okay, so I have here P squared plus how many big B, little b boxes here? 2PQ plus Q squared equals what? One. 100%. All of them. Let your brain go around it. 
So these right here represent my homozygous dominant. These are my heterozygous, and these are my homozygous recessive. I can tell you, I can work forwards and backwards from this. I can tell you what percentage of the population is expressing a dominant trait, a heterozygous trait, whatever, homozygous recessive, and I can calculate back to the gene, what the gene pool is, right? Or I can start with the gene pool and predict what the population would be. Either way, okay, let me show you another, let me show you, I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit and then I'll come back to these other slides. Look right here. Here are our two equations, okay? These are my allele frequencies, P plus Q equals one. In this case, we said 0.5 plus 0.5 equals one. This is in my gene pool. This is what I have to work with if I take all the alleles and throw them together, okay? P being the dominant allele, Q being the recessive allele. If this is what I have in my gene pool, then this is how it will play out in the population. These will be how much homozygous dominant of the population I will have, how many heterozygous, and how many homozygous recessives I have. Yeah, that's a good one to capture. Whoa. Would you also like me to Instagram this so this is on your little video? Dun 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 Not it. Not it. Explain this. Explain this equation right here. Why did capture this? Okay, got it? Now, if it stays 0.5, 0.5, and we will talk about the conditions that you would need in order to keep it there. Oh, never mind. Um, if it stayed 0.5 and 0.5, then no evolution is occurring. But if it changes at all, then what is occurring? Evolution. evolution. Okay. What kind of things could affect that boar population where it could change from 0 0.5, 0 0.5? What could influence that? Yes? A natural disaster. A natural disaster. Maybe a hunter comes out, okay? Takes out half the population. Whatever you're left with, that's all you're left with. That wasn't natural selection, that was just chance probably, right? Okay, so chance can play out in this. Chance will change it. Do you think chance will change a large population or a small population? What, which one would be easier for chance to work on, large or small? Small. So if you want to avoid, get this in your head, if you want to avoid changing allele frequencies, then your populations always have to be what? Large. Can you always have large populations? No. So therefore, what's likely to happen? Evolution. Evolution. Ah. Okay. What else could change our boar population besides just chance random events? Yes. Amount of, Amount of food they have. Maybe their population is large, they overeat their food. Maybe their resources. And then you're playing into natural selection. Who's best adapted, right, for that environment? So if you want, if you want to prevent evolution from occurring, you better not have any selection at all. Do you think that happens? No. <laughs> selection happens. What else could happen that would change it? Could you get a? Yes, you could. 
All right? So if you, if you don't want evolution to happen, you better make sure there are no mutations. Do you think you can prevent all mutations? No. So guess what's going to happen? Hello. Evolution. Yes? Are things like medicine like countering evolution? Like people surviving? Yes. We keep people alive that are weak and should die. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's counterintuitive to natural selection, right? Because we keep weak people... You know, uh, now do you think I'm saying no? I, no. You know what I'm saying. I get it. Oh my gosh. Okay, yes. Is our technology like obstructing our ability to evolve? Yes. Okay, now. What else? What if some boars travel from another group into our boar population? Could that change it? No. Yes, you can't have any gene flow. No migration, no immigration, no emigration, because that could change it. And therefore, evolution could occur. So anything that changes, anything that changes the gene frequencies, anything that changes our allele frequency in a population, if instead, let's say, our big B becomes 0.7, what's our little b going to be? If P is becomes 0.7, then it's going to be 0.3. Is that going to affect? Let's do that. If you, oh, look, it's already, no, it's not done for you. Let's do that one. Okay? So we knew what it was if it was 0.5 and 0.5, but now if we go to this, right? And I don't have to do a Punnett square to figure out how that play out. I could just look at this, right? Right? Because this equals, I don't have to do the whole Punnett square, right? 0.3 times 0.3 is what? 0 0.09. I would expect now only 9% would have the homozygous recessive trait. What was it for the boars before? 25%. Now only 9% have the homozygous recessive trait. Okay, you with your bio buddy figure out how many have the other trait. Go ahead, figure it out, do the calculation. <laughs> Okay, how many are P squared? Yeah, 0.49 or 49% are going to have the dominant homozygous dominant. This number right here would be 0.49, right? Okay, or I could say 49%. And the homozygous recessive is 9%, right? And then this would be 0.3 times 0.7 is what? 0.21, and this one is 0.21, so this is what? 42. Now look at this. Which one would display the dominant trait? How many would display the dominant trait? Your P squareds and your 2PQs will display the dominant trait, right? 91% when you add these up? Uh, good math, because this is 91% and the homozygous region is 9%. Whoops. <laughs> okay? And that equals 100% of all the population. How are you feeling about that? Check with your bio buddy. Are you comprehending? Okay, so now, this is Hardy-Weinberg Law. This is Mr. Freeze, who was also our governor at one point. Oh my God. I did a press conference with him one time, and he was very short. He had on high heeled cowboy boots, but he was very nice. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, if you can freeze allele frequencies, then you can stop evolution. If not, then what will happen? Evolution. evolution. So, you, you, we use these equations to analyze the changes in allele frequencies. So, let's do a little math here. Read the question carefully. Do you want just the number? Yeah, just the number. Yes, you're yourself. I'm going to talk to you about that. Two seconds.
Let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, that's all I'm waiting for. Okay, um, yeah, four of you pass. Let's see what the others put. Oh, you just threw in the percentage. Oh, well, that's all. Can we all pass? One. That's all funny. Did I have what percentage? Okay, now, let me help you with this. Let's think it through. I want you to get this the first time out of the shoot, so everybody dial it in. 4% of the members of the population of pea plants are short. Being short, okay, if you are short, okay, what is your genotype? Little t, little t, right? So I'm saying 4% are short, okay? Which means they're little t, little t, which in our equation would be what? Point two. Would be what? Q squared, okay? So how do you write, how do you write 4%? 0.04. 0 .04. 0 .04. So point, so when I, if I write Q squared, then equals what? 0.04. Are you okay with just that part? Yes. Okay. I, when you are talking about a trait, you've got to have two alleles. So you just need to decide, are those two alleles big T, big T? Are they big T, little t? Or little t, little t? If you're talking about a trait. Okay. So now I know Q squared is 0.04. Could I solve for Q? Mm -hmm. What would Q be? Q then, if you took the square root of this, right? Then Q would be equal to what? 0.2. Now, riddle me all the way out. What else could you tell me from that? Figure everything else out that you could figure out. I wanna know about what are the percentages of the other two genotypes. You should be able to figure this out just from this. Talk it out with your bio buddy. Point two is the answer to this question. I'm just asking you to figure it out. Can you do percentages or no? Um, no. Okay, so let me see where you're at. The answer to this question is, what is the frequency of the recessive allele? It's right here. I told you, point two. We just worked it out. So what is the frequency of the dominant allele? Yeah. So P equals, P equals 0.8. So what could you tell me? I already know Q squared is 4%. What could you tell me? How many of them are, are homozygous dominant? 64%. And how did you get that? P squared are all the homodoms, right? Do you agree? And P is 0 0.8. 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 is 64. 0.64. So 64% are homozygous dominant. Could you tell me how many are probably heterozygous? Yeah. 30, 30. What, what's the heterozygous part of the equation? Yeah, 2PQ are the, all the heterozygotes are your 2PQs. So P is 0.8, Q is 0 0.2, 0.2 times 0.8 is, is what? 0.2 times 0.8 is? 16 times 2 is? 32. You see it? So I can give you anything. I can give you the P and Q, that's the gene pool. Or I could give you where it's at, how it plays out in the population, all the genotypes, and you can work your way and solve for everything. Okay? Um, and so then that was what, okay, so we have lots of options there. So that's what I asked here. If 4% of the members of a population are short, what is the frequency of the dominant allele? Well, if we know the recessive allele is 0.2, then the dominant allele, P has to equal what? 0.8. And then this question says, okay, if 4% of the members of the population are short, what is the predicted percentage of individuals that would be heterozygous if this population were at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Heterozygous, what part of our equation is that? 2PQ. 2PQ. So we already established that Q is 0.2. We established that because we said 4% of the population had the recessive trait. Those are the Q squares, take the square root, right? 
And we know then P has to be 0.8. How do I know P has to be 0.8? One. Yeah, P plus Q equals 1 times 2. And that's where we came up with 32% uh, are probably heterozygotes. I'm predicting. I don't know, but I'm predicting. Okay? Um, and then if P squared equals 0.36, what percentage of the population has the recessive phenotype assuming a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Give it a go. Percentage sign in. It's okay, we'll look at it. We'll if you get it, you got it. All right, so let me let me walk you through this in case for those struggling a little bit. So P squared equals 0.36. First of all, tell me when I'm talking about P squared, what am I really talking about? Uh, those individuals displaying the dominant trait, and they are what for it? homozygous dominant. If I was talking about pea plants, who would they be? Big, big T, big T. They would be the big T, big T's. Okay? So P squared, if I was talking about pea plants, these would be all the big T, big T's. So based on the premise, okay, that I know exactly how many of them are P squared, I can solve for what? P. Now, I, I'm not saying 36% show the dominant trait, because who would show the dominant trait? The P squareds and the 2PQs. Got that? Get that in your head. Okay, 2PQs would also show the dominant, because they're big T, little t, right? Okay, so, but I can solve now for P by taking the square root, so P equals what? 0.6. If I know P is 0.6, what else do I know? Q, Q has got to be what? 0.4, because P plus Q equals 1. Now I can solve anything, right? I could solve, in this case, I want to know, oh, what did I want to know? Well, recessive what phenotype. has the recessive phenotype? Okay, what letters do I need to have for recessive phenotype? Those have to be the Q squares. So all I have to do is 0.4 times 0.4, and that is 0.16 or 16% show the recessive phenotype. Okay, then, Papa. All right. 0.16%. Yeah. Now, how many of them would show the heteros? How many of them would be heterozygous for the trait? Who are the heterozygotes for the trait? Who in the equation? 2 PQs. Okay. So my 2 PQs, I could solve for that too. It's 2 times. P, which is 0.6, times Q, which is 0.4. 4 times 6 is 24, times 2 is 48%. Ask your bio buddy, where are you in this? Where are you in the Shadowlands, Sunshine? Now, there are examples of this in your book. There are practice questions of this in your book. I have not seen an AP exam in the recent history that does not ask a Hardy-Weinberg equation. Okay, I have not seen one that does not ask this. Okay, so let's make sure we understand it and then let's apply the significance of this to this chapter. So what this chapter, what you're talking about here is if you can freeze those allele frequencies then there is no evolution. If you can't freeze them, evolution will occur. So what kind of things could cause them to change. We already talked about it. What are some things that could cause it to change? Mutations. Mutations, okay? Mutations can change one allele to a new allele, okay? That's the only way you can get new alleles is through mutation, right? Everything else is just a recombination of the gene pool, making new combinations coming out of your gene pool. But a mutation would, um, would change the allele frequencies. 
Something else that would change the allele frequency, so you would need to freeze this so it wouldn't happen, you can't have any migration, no gene flow. So these are stingrays migrating, but you can't have any mixing of them. They would have to stay their individual population. No new stingrays coming in, no stingrays leaving. That is something else that would freeze the allele frequency. By freezing the allele frequency, we're preventing what? Evolution. Evolution. But the point is, can we even really freeze it? No, okay? So another one is, um, uh, oh, this is an example of gene flow with rat snakes. And the thing is, is if you look here and look at this population here in southern Florida, and you compare them with, um, what state am I in? Nebraska. Nebraska? Okay. These two right here, they don't mate. So there's no gene flow between them. First of all, it's because they don't have a car to drive and go have sex over there, right? Okay? But they will mate with their immediate neighbor, and this one will mate with their immediate neighbor, and this one will mate with this, and this one will mate with this one, but by the time you get there, they don't. Okay? So sometimes it's hard, because sometimes they will just, and it's hard to draw the line on speciation, because in a pinch, they will. And also, if they have sex in a lab, that doesn't mean they would have sex in nature, right? It's just the only one there in the lab. Okay? Or maybe they don't have sex in the lab because they don't like the conditions in the lab, so they don't have it. Not because they wouldn't, but because they don't want to do it in the lab situation. Right? So those are all questions you might have with gene flow. Okay. Um, you have to, it's funny because they're bugs. Okay. <laughs> you would have to have random reproduction. Meaning you can't say this one is better than another one. It's like saying, okay, random, whoever, I'll have sex with you. Okay? So random reproduction, is that likely to happen? No. Are there situations where that will happen? Yeah. Like polo worms or whatever, they just like ejaculate all their sperm out into the water. They ejaculate all their eggs out into the water. Oh, they don't ejaculate their eggs. They release their <laughs> eggs. And then it's kind of random whoever gets with whoever. Okay. So there are examples of that, but that usually there's some sort of selection. Okay. Um, a fourth condition is no genetic drift, which would mean you always need a large population. Genetic drift is chance, okay? Just chance things happening. And chance impacts a smaller population um, more readily than a larger population, okay? And the last one is no selection. Now look, what is that right there? Cobra. Co okay, a cobra. What's on the back of it? Like Looks like eye spots. Do you think he painted those on with a little makeup before he went out? No. no. Why do you think there are eye spots here? Yeah, predators coming from the back, okay? Predators coming from the back might see this and go, ah, and go away. Then one who didn't have eye spots. So over time, those that had eye spots were selected for. Okay. So, um, it's hard to meet all five conditions. It's hard to meet all those conditions. So, therefore, probably evolution then must be occurring. And we see evolution occurring here just even with these moths, right? Remember industrial melanism. I think I've introduced this to you already. So, when soot was on there, when there was no soot, the dark moths would always get eaten. But once soot was on here, the dark moth numbers went up and the light colored moths went down, right? Because um, they were, you could see them. This is a change in allele frequency. So therefore it is evolution. Now, is this evolution to a whole new species? No, but is it evolution and could, if you gave vast amounts of time, could you evolve a new species? Probably more than likely, yes. How would it be the dark colored ones? if they were living in an environment that they didn't survive as well. Probably because there was a... a gene yeah, gene mutation. Just like the red hair, right? Okay. Now, look on your notes. Go to microevolution in the peppered moths. Population genetics. Studies um, the diversity of populations at the level of the gene, how it changes. Allele frequencies, gene pool, all the alleles in the population. Do you see where I am? I'm just getting caught up. Okay, go down to 2D. Genotypes as a result of the allele frequencies. As a result of the allele frequencies. Okay. 
Okay, you have the P squareds. What are the PQs? Heterozygous. And then look at E. If the allele frequencies for a particular trait remain unchanged, P and Q values remain the same, generation after generation, then that trait is not changing. And it's said to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, now Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, I gave you the equations. Go down to the Hardy-Weinberg principle only applies if the population remains unchanging. To ensure that, five conditions must be met. No mutation, no migration, large gene pool, random mating, and no selection. E, since it is difficult not to violate these conditions in a natural population, alleles must be changing, and therefore evolution must be occurring. Okay, so we're just kind of, you, you've already learned this, we're just kind of spelling this out, or some examples here, yes? I still don't, like, why does random mating need to happen? Okay, let's, we're going to hit that one. Okay. Okay, because, well, let me hit it right now, okay? Why did giraffe necks get longer, do you think? <coughs> high trees. Okay, high trees. So those giraffes that ate the most food, right, oh. had the longer necks. And those are the ones that were the biggest, the strongest, and the ones that people wanted to mate with, right? Or not people, but other giraffes, <laughs> right? Okay. If there's no selection, that means a female would mate with somebody who had a long neck and was strong just as much as somebody who had a short neck and weak. Do you think that happens? No. They mated with the one that was... Strong. Yeah, the strong. And that has to do with sexual selection. Okay. All right. So... Um, Agents that cause change in, in frequencies are things like mutations. Mutations can cause um, polymorphisms, where there's variations. Just like we talked about red hair, or those of you who have the same mutation I have, which is what color eyes? Blue eyes. We're a mutant. Okay? So mutations can cause changes in color, um, like in these birds. So on your mutation, Defined a change um, to DNA sequence can serve as a source for variation. Okay, another one is migration or gene flow, which we already talked about. And gene flow is movement of alleles between populations. So mutations are causing changes in allele frequency, migration is. A small population size can cause um, changes. And this is due to what's called genetic drift. So if a boat is drifting, is it going any one place with a purpose? No. So here your genes are just drifting due to chance. And it has a larger impact on smaller populations. Like this, look at this town, 195. Now there are two categories of genetic drift. One of the um, categories is called the bottleneck effect. Okay, and the bottleneck effect says you go through some disaster, which is like the neck of the bottle, which is like traffic. Think about traffic when there's a bottleneck in traffic, three of the lanes are closed and there's only one lane that can go through. Okay, so these all get wiped out due to disaster. The ones that get through, <coughs> is this representative of your original population? No, only a few got through. It doesn't mean that the best adapted ones got through. It was just chance who was there that got through. So if we had a freeway that was starting to close and only 10 cars got through, okay, and they just happened to be really bad cars, old crappy cars, and that all cars were built off of those cars forevermore, that doesn't mean, right, that wasn't representative of all the cars. They weren't all Rolls Royces or Jaguars or Mercedes and BMWs and Ford, 
Okay. Ford. 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 Yeah, it doesn't mean that they were representative of all the possible cars that could get through that traffic accident. Small number got through. That was due to chance. So for instance, you could have a whole bunch of green frogs and brown frogs, and you could have variation, but a big tree or log falls on all the brown frogs, so all you're left with are green frogs. It doesn't mean the green frogs are best adapted. They just survived the disaster that took place. Now, a second form of genetic drift is called founder's effect. Now, founder's effect means you have your large population. Think about the whole population of the school, okay? Let's call that our large population, or the whole population of this entire town. If we said, and somebody came here and said, there's gonna be an atom bomb, it's falling on this town right now, all of you get in this big chopper that I have, let's fly away to an island, and then we will survive. Are we representative of this entire town? No. Whatever traits we have could be some bad genes amongst us. And now we're gonna start off and totally establish a new community somewhere else. Whatever we have in our gene pool collectively in this room, we're the founders of a new population. That's gonna influence forevermore that area. This was with the Amish. When the Amish settled from Europe here in the United States, they brought with them a six-fingered dwarf. As a result, there is a higher incident of six-fingered dwarfism in the Amish here in the United States than there is in the general population. Why? Because Amish, if you're going to be truly Amish, right, you're just going to mate with another Amish person. You're reproductively isolated, okay? Like many of you in your cultures, right? You better not bring home somebody who's not within your religion, right? Okay. Could cause problems. Okay? So you have a higher incidence of people, and you can see here, who are six-fingered dwarfs. All right. Oh, before we talk about inbreeding, though that's a good, good thing to talk about right now, go to small population size. Small population size, A. Genetic drift, changes in the allele frequencies of a gene pool due to what? Oh, you don't know, chance. <laughs> Smaller gene pools um, are more impacted by drift. Okay, a bottleneck effect is a disaster, so new populations allele frequency does not reflect the original. Number two, founder effect, portion of population starts a new population with a fraction of the total alleles. Okay, now inbreeding. We don't do that much, okay? It doesn't necessarily change the allele frequency, it just it changes the grouping of the alleles which could affect the phenotype um, eventually but it really does just do the genotype frequency because you're associating with one more than another in inbreeding. And that's a form of what's called assortative mating. Oh, I'm gonna come to that in just a minute. Never mind. Okay, so go to inbreeding and mating with relatives doesn't affect the allele frequencies but can ultimately affect genotypes. Okay, non-random mating. Okay, so do you think that this is a random mating event? No, okay. So this is non-random mating. You are mating with a purpose, trying to find the one that is best suited for you, okay? And it's not, if it was total random mating, you would just say, okay, any of these are fine, okay? You don't care what M&M you get so long as you get an M&M, okay? That, that would be random mating, okay? Non-random mating is only eating the blue M&Ms, okay, and having that with a purpose. So, um, in this case, this bird is looking at these two to mate with, okay? This would be an example of assortative mating. Who is he going to mate with? Who do you think? Oh, yes, he mates with this one, okay? 
So non-random mating, I gave you everything. And assortative mating, I gave you everything. And then this, okay, you're wanting to mate with someone just like you. You find your favorite monster? Okay, now, um, you, you could, if eventually, only, those are the ones you mate with, you could become a species where only the blackbird heads only mate with other blackbird heads or only the red. Okay, you could eventually, it could lead to speciation. Okay, so underneath the um, num, 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 natural selection, num, 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 num. natural selection we have already talked about. Um, 5A, some phenotypes have a reproductive advantage. Their traits will be passed on while others will not. And natural selection is the foundation for Darwin's theory of evolution. Now, there are a bunch of Hardy-Weinberg problems in your book. Okay, I put a link to one such one, just a website. You could Google it and just do Hardy Weinberg problems and be very familiar with them. So that's where that link goes. It goes to a website. And um, and I'm gonna, here, um, we've already talked about this, about giraffes. Here's the picture with the dead giraffes. Um, and this is comparing Lamarck and Darwin. So we're all, I'm gonna let that go away. Um, let's talk about different types of selection. The first one is stabilizing selection. Now, look at the picture. What's happening over time? Look at the initial distribution after time and after more time. Blue tells slate. What do you see happening? Do you know what a fudge size is? How many eggs they lay? So, the norm here is how many eggs? Four to five. Over here, they're laying more than four to five eggs. Here, they're laying less. Over time, though, the norm is keeping it right there. This is called stabilizing selection. You're not going for either extreme. That's the same for us too. How many babies do we tend to give birth to? One. One. What is the poundage of a lot of babies that we give birth to? Six, eight, six, yes, one. six, seven, eight maybe. You don't hear about a lot of 15 and 16 pound babies, though that can happen. And you don't hear about a lot of five pound babies, though that can happen. That's stabilizing selection because it's more likely to survive if you have that particular birth weight as opposed, take a look at this type of selection, directional selection. This is with the equus and horse evolution. What's happening to the body size? Getting bigger. Getting bigger and bigger. This is not stabilizing, this is directional. Okay, if they're stabilizing and directional, guess what the third one's going to be? Stabilizing. Disruptive. 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 You go for the extremes. Doing this, could this lead to a new species? Yes. Doing this, could this lead to a new species? Yes. What doesn't lead to a new species? Stabilizing. Okay. So look at your types of natural selection. Stabilizing selection, 1B, extreme selected against. Directional selection and extreme phenotype is favored. Curve shifts in one direction. It leads to speciation. Disruptive selection, intermediate um, selected against, and it leads to speciation. Leads to speciation. All right, sexual selection. Did we talk about sexual selection already? No. No, okay. Take a look at this. <laughs> now you might consider it rude. I understand. But what is this saying? What is she looking for? Love. Love. Why do you think she's looking for love? Why would that be an advantage to her? An adaptation for her. Commitment, have a good mate. Commitment, have a good mate. Why? 
She's the one who raises. raises and gives birth. She's vulnerable while she's pregnant, and she's the one who has to give birth. She's the one who suckles the child. Do you see how it would be important to her because she just has one egg become available, and then the whole time she's pregnant, right, that's a commitment. How much time? Nine, Nine months. months. Okay? And the amount of time it tells me to say him, him just made a thousand sperm. Okay? And you are making up oh, another thousand and another thousand and another thousand. So he's not necessarily looking for love. He's looking for this right here. Because he is trying to get his genes out there. Okay? We didn't talk about this? Oh, I, okay, I'm sorry. So there's intersexual selection is if Betty is choosing Joe over Jim, okay? Intersexual, she's choosing. And intrasexual, Joe and Jim are fighting to get chosen, okay? Intersexual is like she's trying to make a good choice. I, we're simplifying it by saying she's looking for love, but she's looking for somebody who can provide for her, who's the strongest, who will give her the best gene. Whereas in intrasexual selection, they're competing against each other. Okay, competing against each other. Okay, we have to make a decision in one minute. You already made it? Yeah. What, make a proposal, we'll vote on it. Um, so my proposal is that we push the test back. <laughs> That's my proposal. I think everyone agrees. If you don't, then. Uh, or, yay. or, I'm gonna offer a counter, I'm not saying I like one over the other. It makes zero difference to me. Zero difference to me, okay? I have no agenda other than I want to get through it. The other option would be take it as far as we've learned it yeah. and get it over with. Yes. 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 Oh, yes. Yes. Why? Yes. I it, why? why? I'd have half of chapter 16 on it. Up to the Hardy Weinberg problem. Well, you'll get them eventually on the final, but at least I'm holding you accountable for this Friday. As far as we've gone. Do you give it that? No, no, right. Yeah, so let's, I think you'll want to get it over with, yes. and I'll hold you up through the Hardy Weinberg problem. Yes. Deal? Yes. I'll finish this, but you're, it's only a multiple choice. Yeah, and it's only 50 points, and it's just trying to keep you accountable so you stay up with all your information. Okay? Up through the Hardy Weinberg problems of this chapter. Yes. Up through Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. So that would be up through 16.1. One. 16.1. Yeah, hashtag easier. Okay? Good job, guys. If you're watching this late, have a piece of toast or cake. Make good choices. <laughs>